be mine. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast where we will help you learn to invest in 20 minutes or less. We break down the world of investing from beginning to dividend so that you can hopefully make some returns. My name is Bryce, and for the second time in a very short space of time, I am not joined by my equity buddy, Alec Renahan. Unfortunately, he is MIA again. Circumstances have uh, meant that he is not going to be able to join me on this episode. Uh, I can guarantee that he will be back up firing, ready to go on our next one. He's very disappointed and incredibly apologetic that he can't make it. That's how life goes sometimes, and uh, he will be back. The good news is we have another expert investor to bring you as part of our interview series, and so Ren does actually make an appearance in that. Uh, So you will be hearing his voice for for those of you who are devastated that uh, he's not joining us, and we're worried that you wouldn't be hearing his dulcet tones for a second week in a row. So have no fear, he will be joining us. So before we jump into our amazing episode that we're bringing you today, just a quick shout out to the Thought Starters crew. Those of you who have signed up to our weekly email, awesome. Those of you who haven't, jump on to our website on our homepage. You can sign up to our Thought Starters email. Uh, We only send out one email each week on a Monday morning and it is designed to give you uh, a way to procrastinate better on a Monday. We'll send you in articles that have piqued our interest, all things investing related, and uh, a, a lovely curated news section that Ren takes a lot of time uh, to do. So uh, sign up. We also send you articles that are basic 101s specifically for the beginner. So uh, we don't send you any spam. Jump on, sign up. It's, a, it's an awesome way to start your Monday. Speaking of awesome, we, as I said, have an interview to, to share with you guys today, and this is one we've been trying to line up for a long time now, and we are super stoked that we had the ability uh, to get him on. So, I mean, how often do you come across someone who has graduated from university and then is given the job of managing the money of UBS, one of the biggest investment banks in the world? Then this person went on to become vice president of Morgan Stanley, another massive investing bank. Uh, He was then managing director of derivatives at the Galleon Group and then president of the $400 million hedge fund Kramer Berkowitz. Ah, But if that wasn't enough, our guest then started Minionville Media, which was an Emmy award-winning financial media company and is now founding partner and chief investment officer of CB1 Capital, which is an investment manager that specializes in the supply chain of cannabinoid-based wellness solutions and products. He is the king of pot on Wall Street, has appeared on Fox, CNBC, CNN, and is published in the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, and Fortune. And we are super impressed with his CV and very excited to have him on the show. His name is Todd Harrison. So we discuss all things pot related with with Todd, marijuana. He he knows so much about it and is one of the, the pioneer investors in, in Wall Street at the moment in the space. So uh, we start with a bit of information and, and background of what it was like to start your career in Wall Street and then win an Emmy Award and then move into uh, talking all things pot. So we hope you guys enjoy it just as much as we did. Todd Harrison, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. To kick it off, we got to ask about a uh, letter that is pinned to the top of your Twitter. Um, <laughs> and I guess I got to read, I want to read one sentence so our listeners get a flavor for it. And I quote, he was incompetent to the point that the firm incurred losses of several millions of dollars and was sued by no fewer than 48 of our clients. So we got to ask to kick off the interview, um, can you give us the story behind the letter? Is it, is it real? Is it fake? Is it a joke? Uh, I'm sure there's well, a it's story. A, it's a real letter. It's a real letter on Morgan Stanley Stationery from you know, circa, gosh, I think that was 1990. It was a, it was a gag. My, uh, my manager at, in Morgan Stanley uh, in London uh, handed that to me uh, to uh, just to play a gag on me and then handed me a proper introduct, uh, uh, recommendation letter thereafter. But I, I came across it a, a few years later and I just, you know, uh, to get something like that on Morgan Stanley Stationery is, is a bit of a coup. Absolutely. <laughs> 
So, Todd, you've uh, had a pretty extensive career on Wall Street, you know, Vice President Morgan Stanley, MD of derivatives at Galleon Group, and then going on to uh, the hedge fund Kramer Berkowitz. So, I guess before all that started, we'd like to just get a bit into your background. So, what what got you really interested in in investing? Well, you know, when I was in when I was in college uh, at Syracuse University, uh, I did uh, quite well in two courses, accounting and finance, and I ended up working for Morgan Stanley in London um, in between my junior and senior year. And it just got completely tooled on by the traders. My job was to bring the trading breaks to these traders on the floor, and I just got completely abused. And uh, by the time I came home from London, I no longer wanted to crunch the numbers. I wanted to generate them. So, Todd, from your time in Wall Street, um, what what's something that people don't understand about Wall Street and uh, how it operates? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, I, I would ordinarily say the human element behind it because the Wall Street I grew up with was very much a relationship business, but with upwards of 70 percent of trading done by the computers these days. I don't know if that answer still flies. Uh, but I do think at the at the uh, as a common denominator, I do think Wall Street remains a relationship business. And uh, a lot of good people uh, got a lot. I got a pretty bad rap over over the course of the last decade, I would say after the uh, global financial crisis, but uh, a lot of good people on Wall Street. So speaking of people on Wall Street, what's one of the major characteristics that you noticed amongst some of the more successful traders on on Wall Street? I would say discipline, uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, really just to stay, uh, stick with your process, whatever that process may be. Uh, much easier said than done, even, you know, I'm 30 years into this and I could point to 13 things yesterday that I did wrong. Uh, but, you know, over the course of time, you know, you want to stay true to your process and stay true to your discipline. Uh, and that should get you through any market. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a good lesson. And it's something that we um, we keep hearing from from the people that we interview about, you know, trusting your process, staying disciplined, sticking with it. O- over your time in Wall Street, um, are there any other really important lessons that you've learned or that anything that you've observed from other investors that you think uh, is really important for uh, to be a successful investor? Well, I, I think... Uh what I would say is not just for investing, but for life and something my grandfather taught me and something I try to teach my kids uh, is that all you have is your name and your word uh, and you got to stay true to both of them. Uh, and I think uh, on Wall Street, you know, or in life, you know, where once you breach that confidence or that trust, it's very difficult to get it back. Uh, you know, so I, I just think it's it's paramount, you know, on Wall Street or anywhere to maintain your integrity. You know, we live in a bit of a post-truth world, uh, more on my side of the world than your side of the world. But, you know, for what it's worth, I think things like uh, integrity and, and character still matter, uh, even if it's not something that seems to be winning uh, right now in the world. In your time on, on Wall Street, uh, I'm assuming you would have had to have dealt with not only some large uh, wins, but also some some losses along the way. And I guess one of the hardest emotions for beginners uh, to get over is the fear of losing money, particularly when you're sort of starting out. So what was so how did you deal with that feeling, you know, going into to Wall Street as a junior? And then was there any sort of particular strategies that you used to overcome that fear? It took it took me a long time to figure it out, but what, what, once I realized that you very rarely score goals when you're skating on your heels, uh, you know, as I tell my son when he plays lacrosse, or as I tell you know uh, you know folks who are trading, if you if you're playing, uh, you know, not to make a mistake, or if you're trading uh, not to lose, you're probably going to lose money or make a mistake. But you have to you know you have to uh, stay on your on your toes. You gotta you gotta be aggressive. You gotta trade to win. You gotta play to win. Uh, you'll miss shots, you'll miss trades, you'll lose money. Uh, but again, if you go back to your discipline and you go back to your process, uh, I think over the course of time you'll be, you know, you'll be much better off. Todd, we read a quote from you that we found interesting, and we're hoping that you can uh, shine a light on it. So the quote is: "The hedge fund community has evolved into ten thousand people standing in a circle, shooting each other, looking for the same stocks." Uh, can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I think we can all, you know, probably less so now than it was two weeks ago, but you have a lot of people hanging in the same 
uh, in the same stocks, where, you know, whether that's FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, you know, I don't think that there's much of an edge, even in my, in my strategy, which we'll, we'll touch on as you start to get to the more liquid and the more widely held names, uh, I think your edge, your relative edge decreases in kind, you know, so, so as we, you know, look at our strategy here on the cannabis side, you know, certainly there's a bit of a capital flow uh, process that we watch, uh, which we can talk about if you'd like, but uh, certainly uh, as you go down, as we call it downstream uh, on the cannabis trade, it's a lot less crowded and we think uh, that's where you could find much more of an edge. So before we do get into the cannabis side of things, uh, we just want to briefly touch on on Minionville, if, if that's how it's pronounced, because you're an Emmy Award winner and that's something I would assume is pretty unusual for a, a, a Wall Street trader. So you, you left Wall Street to start uh, Minionville in 2003, I believe. And to, to kick this conversation off, can you explain to our listeners what Minionville did and how it led to you being an Emmy Award winner? The backstory for that, uh, you know, circles back to when I was uh, managing Kramer Berkowitz. There was a 400 million dollar fund and i was asked to fill in uh for my partner jim at the time and write a column or a trading diary as the case may be uh in in two in the uh, y2k in 2000 and i did it um i actually enjoyed the synthesis and connected with you know the audience and over the course of time I uh, really just uh you know took to writing as a synthesis for my thought process and really an accountability uh, something that I could look back on and, and, and you know, self-check mechanism. Um, you know, so, you know, after 9-11, you know, I was down there and I saw some things uh, which uh, I wouldn't wish on anybody, uh, but certainly changed my outlook in life, uh, changed my uh, thoughts about, you know, what I felt was meaningful. Uh, certainly the difference between having fun and, and being happy was something that uh, was really crystallizing in my mind even before 9-11. But after you know seeing what I saw and the people holding hands and jumping from atop the towers and all the rest of it, uh, I decided that I wanted to do something more meaningful. Uh, and I started a, a digital uh, magazine, a financial magazine, for lack of a better word. This was before there were blogs and certainly before social media. Uh, and, um, you know, had at it for, you know, a good 15 years of educating people uh, and empowering people to make better and more informed financial financial decisions. Um, and we did that, you know, uh, you know, uh, I thought quite well, uh, the economics obviously changed with the, with, uh, you know, the democratization of content and, and really just, there was no barrier to entry anymore, which just completely destroyed the model. Uh, I sold, uh, parts of the business. Um, and you know, one of the things that we had done just to circle back to the Emmy, uh, we had branded the wall street bull and bear. And the idea was, you know, as I would uh, talk through uh, the lens of, uh, you know, the bull and the bear, because uh, there's always a bull case and there's always a bear case. And that residual grist is what you'll read about the next day in the Wall Street Journal. But it's also where education is found and it's where profitability is found. Uh, so we brought those characters to life. Uh, we animated them uh, and they won a couple of Emmy Awards, uh, which was exciting. But at the same time, uh, you know, certainly not uh, the type of reward you see on Wall Street. Uh, but no. it looks good on, on, on the, uh, you know, on my mantle and it has zero <laughs> revenue attached. Uh, so it is consistent with the new age digital model. Fascinating. But it, but, it, but it was really just to continue. It was during that time that I came across cannabis. I think it was 2012 when I went on TV and called it my single best idea for the next decade. And certainly early uh, by a few years. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I think the market's starting to, to, to catch on to what you know, we first started to see and then, you know, obviously in the last five or six years really focused on efficacy driven solutions and plant based efficacy. And and now, uh, you know, with the biosynthetics and, and some of the other approaches, uh, we think this is disruptive healthcare. You know, certainly there's going to be two two sides to this market. On the one side, you'll see the nutraceuticals, you'll see the beverages and the consumer packaged goods. Uh, on the other, we think you'll see this, you know, these efficacy driven solutions uh, that are going to do everything from uh, promote wellness to we think cure disease. It's probably a good time to introduce CB1 Capital. Um, so you've started this fund to focus on investing in 
cannabis and cannabis related businesses. Um, and, you know, it stems from that quote that you just mentioned, uh, that cannabis would be the single best investment over the decade. So to introduce our listeners to this concept, can you explain why you thought it would be the best investment over a decade? And then also why you thought, why, why you created a fund solely focused on that investment? Sure. Well, you know, to be honest and to be candid, I was, I was wrong you know, when I first started to look at this, um, or at least misguided in that I was really looking at the social utility whether that would be um, the whether that would be the tax revenue or the job growth or the crime rate or the prison population decreasing, uh, it just made a lot of sense uh, to to me. And as I really dug down and started to do the work, uh, you know, was really just fascinated by the, the things that uh, I found in in that the American Medical Association uh, was prescribing cannabis as medicine back in the twenties. Uh, this was very much part of the uh, of the protocol for physicians back in the day uh, what happened were uh, were that some of the uh, elite at the time the William Randolph Hearst and the DuPonts they perceived cannabis and hemp as uh, as threats to their uh, to their industries uh, so they uh, they created a newfangled word called marijuana uh, and they uh, moved to ban it uh, the American Medical Association did not know that marijuana was cannabis by the time they found out, it was too late. Uh, but that started what's been an 80-some-odd-year uh, propaganda campaign by the U.S. government to really demonize this plant. And certainly that's created these unintended consequences, which uh, we're certainly trying to capture as we look across the landscape now. Uh, and we see an arbitrage of time versus policy. Uh, we do believe this is efficacious and this will go through uh, the clinical process. We think it's an arbitrage of price versus institutional buyers, uh, especially for U.S. names and Australian names for that matter. We have uh, large Australian holdings. Um, we think it's an arbitrage of perception. We think this is about getting well, but not about getting high. Uh, and then finally, we think it's an arbitrage of liquidity in that, you know, this approach and that we're managing uh, a strategy in the publicly traded securities. We are not a marijuana related business. We are a healthcare fund. Uh, we're a wellness fund. Uh, we are just taking a, a rather different tact at um, at the wellness market. But, you know, to fully understand the potential here, uh, you have to dig down a little bit into the science behind this. And the science is fascinating. You know, when we set out to do this, my partner and I, we, we talked to everybody that we could find who, who knew uh, about the uh, the research that was being done. Uh, and the feedback, the, the, the uh, mosaic that was really painted for us uh, effectively went something like this, in that over the last 100 years, we've gone from hunters and gatherers to desk jobs, and we've gone from eating processed foods and trans fats uh, to eating processed foods and trans fats um, and diet and, and heredity and exercise obviously all play a part. Uh, but over the course of time, the tone of our endocannabinoid system changes. Uh, and it's the belief system that that, ha that you know, is, is responsible, uh, at least partly, if not directly, uh, for a lot of the unmet medical conditions, a lot of the diseases that have manifested over the last 70 or 80 years. Um, and to really understand, you know, how this all works, uh, you know, our bodies produce endocannabinoids. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a system. The endocannabinoid system was not discovered until the late '80s or early '90s. But we all have them. Any, you know, if you have a vertebrae, you have an endocannabinoid system. Uh, and what that does is it regulates neurotransmissions within your body. Uh, so what you know, there's been a fair amount of work that's been done on the endocannabinoid system, even though it's relatively young um, in terms of uh, you know being discovered, 30 some odd years. Uh, but we, what was never really studied, except by you know a chosen few, uh, whether it was in Israel or Italy or Spain or or Europe for that matter, uh, was that the cannabinoids found in cannabis are identical in action to the endocannabinoids that your body produces. Uh, so the ability to look at the endocannabinoid system as a retrograde pathway um, where you can target receptors throughout your body. You have the CB1 receptors in your head, the CB2 receptors in your extremities and organs uh, for the most part. And rather than, and this is a bit of a crude analysis, but rather than taking a pill and hoping it gets to where it needs to go, you can actually target receptors in particular parts of your body. Uh, and, and it's exciting. It's, it's frontier science. We know 
uh, a lot less than we don't know, right? There's a lot left to learn, uh, but what we, do know, what, what we do know is very encouraging through the lens of health and wellness. Fascinating. I mean, certainly sound very a very specialized area of um, investment by the sound of it. So, you know, we've, we've heard a lot in the media lately about, you know, Tilray and canopy growth and the explosion of pot stocks. And, you know, it's a, it's a popular pick for millennials in their portfolio and this sort of stuff. But I'm assuming they're not the companies that you're investing in, Todd. So I'd like to get an idea from you on, on sort of what the specifics are. What, what are you investing in at the moment? Can you give us an idea and some examples of some of the companies that you're investing in? Sure. So closer to home for you, I mean, we have some pretty good positions in the Australian market. Uh, one of them uh, is Elixinol, EXL. Uh, we have a large position. That's a CBD uh, and hemp play. We think they're going to be a pretty robust consumer products play. Uh, and, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, from a fundamental standpoint, we think it's very attractive relative to some of the other players in the market, whether that's Charlotte's Web, for instance, is, is an example of another player. Uh, but we like Licks and All. We like the management, Paul Benheim. Uh, you know, we think he knows uh, his way around the space. Uh, so that's one uh, Australian name that we uh, were keen on. Uh, a few more. Um, Oscan, uh, it's been under a bit of pressure of late, but so has the rest of the world. Uh, but this is a company where where you have Canopy Growth owns uh, almost 10%. Uh, and we think uh, that Australia is going to emerge as the service station to the Southern Hemisphere in terms of cannabis, uh, particularly maybe for the Far East, uh, uh, Japan, which may not have the land necessary to, uh, to really cultivate. Uh, but we do think that, you know, that Australia sits in a pretty unique uh, uh, spot. So we like Elixinol, we like Oscan, uh, Can Group is another one. Uh, Can Group is one where Aurora, the Canadian licensed producer, owns uh, Rough Justice, about 20% of that. Uh, so we, we, like these, uh, we like these stocks. Uh, certainly we're early. Uh, we think that Australia is probably three or four years behind where Canada is. So that's really interesting, Todd. So when you say, um, you know, Australia is three to four years behind, do you mean in terms of the government regulation as well? Is that something you, you take a position on? Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is wellness. Um, and as a matter of fact, if you recall back to January, uh, when the uh, <laughs> when Jeff Sessions pulled the coal memorandum, uh, that morning, uh, the same morning, and I'm sure it was a coincidence uh, or not, uh, but that morning, the health minister of Australia and the health minister of Canada both came out and said they wanted to dominate the world in cannabis. And unless the health ministers want a nation full of stoners, we have to believe that they see what we see in terms of the efficacy and in, in terms of um, in terms of the market. I mean, look at it this way, right? In the entire world, you've got maybe eighty billion dollars worth of global equities, and that's probably that might even be twice as big as it is. But let's call it fifty to eighty billion of of global equities. Cannabis right now is a cash crop is about three hundred billion dollars, right? So if you start to think about and contemplate the optionality of cannabis and hemp as ingredients, right? Uh, not the end product, but rather the input, um, the active pharmaceutical ingredient in everything from medicine uh, to food, to clothing, to fuel, to plastic composites, to building materials, to pet supplements, to cosmetics and vanity, right? This is going to be ubiquitous. So we think that market looks somewhere to the tune of two to three trillion dollars in 10 years uh, versus maybe 80 billion of global equities now. Uh, we think that has to change. We think we're in the early innings of a secular bull market uh, that's going to be efficacy driven and that most people just don't understand or or have chosen to understand, you know, what they've been told by the U.S. government, which is patently false. Part of the challenge for you is looking out at the world and figuring out where these businesses will spring up, because I imagine there's a massive first mover advantage, and you see that in the price of Canadian stocks. When you look out on the world, where do you see um, other sort of really interesting opportunities um, in terms of, you know, de decriminalization and regulation and stuff like that? Well, I think there's a few buckets, you know, certainly, Austra um, certainly Australia, we talked about, but when we look at capital flows, I, I alluded to it earlier, uh, we see that really through uh, the lens of exposure to the marketplace. So you have three stocks that are Canadian majors that are trading in the U.S. That's Tilray, Canopy and Kronos. Uh, and certainly they've benefited from the exposure and the ability for U.S. investors to participate. Uh, but if you look at, uh, you know, probably the next bucket, which would be the Canadian majors that are trading in Canada, they're Canadian listed. You know, you're looking at companies that are, you know, trading at maybe a dime on the dollar 
uh, on a valuation standpoint, uh, very similar, if not uh, you know precisely similar profiles uh, on some of these companies versus what's traded in the in the U.S. Uh, so the relative discount, again, speaking to the relative edge of um, you know going downstream where there's less liquidity, you're going to find more of an edge. Uh, so we we see it as U.S. listed Canadian majors and then really Canadian listed uh, Canadian players and in, in the mid majors and such in the periphery that we talked about some of these laboratory and extraction plays. Uh, but where it starts to get more interesting for us is in the U.S. names because uh, institutions can't buy those. So it's one of those rare opportunities where you can actually go out and front run an institution. Uh, and there's some good companies uh, emerging in the U.S. that are going to be real players. I mean, you know, Florida's patient count is already half of that of all of Canada. You know, I mean, this is, you know, this is a real uh, market that's about to really take root. So we, we think the U.S. side is, is probably a pretty good risk reward. Um, and, but we think the real frontier is biotech. Uh, and nobody's really even contemplated the notion of cannabis biotech because they don't understand the science behind it. Um, and there's very few people in the world who do understand the science. A few of them happen to be on our board of advisors, and one of them happens to be my partner in this business. So I feel like we have a pretty good moat around that. Uh, but certainly uh, you'll see more and more of that in, in the coming months to years. I just want to pick up on something that you mentioned there because a lot of our listeners might be wondering. So you said that institutions can't buy US listed cannabis stocks. Do you want to just explain why why that is the case and, and what that means in terms of your opportunities? Well, you know, it's still a Schedule One narcotic. So in the eyes of the U.S. government, there's no difference between heroin and cannabis. It's it's like I said, it's it's an agenda that's outdated. It's it's pernicious. And it's, you know, and I believe in my humble opinion, you know, the U.S. government has blood on their hands uh, for holding this kind of hostage for the last 80 years. But nonetheless, you know, most people still think this is a gateway drug as opposed to a solution that's an opioid terminus uh, where 25 percent less people are dying in states where this is legal. But for the most part, uh, you know, U.S. institutions, they won't touch this. Uh, you know, you'll see the Canadian names, uh, the names that are uh, listed up in Canada uh, the front page holders include companies like Vanguard and BlackRock and, and State Street, the big institutions. Uh, we think that same appetite is going to flow to U.S. names. They just they just have, they can't get involved yet because of this uh, federal scheduling. So what does that mean if if a U.S. listed company was big enough to become part of an index? Would, would that mean Vanguard and those index companies would have to exclude them? No, because right now the only names that are listed on the U.S. are the biotech side. You know, there anything else is listed up in Canada. So, you know, we, we just think that this is all, this is a, uh, you know, in, in, in the process of, of, of coming online and it's going to be massive and it's going to be global. Uh, so, you know, we see it as an outside in uh, um, kind of evolution and an inside out evolution, meaning uh, we're seeing other countries adopt almost, you know, uh, at a steady pace now. And then we're seeing states continue to adopt. So this is going to kind of come to a head at the U.S. border. But we actually think that you're going to see cannabis decriminalized uh, and left uh, as a state's right issue as it should be. And we think that's going to be, you know, a lot sooner than a lot of a lot of other people in the space seem to think. So can I just ask about that? Because obviously um, Donald Trump is your president and Jeff Sessions is uh, your attorney general. And Jeff Sessions has traditionally been extremely tough on drugs. You, but you just mentioned that you think it will be de decriminalized and be made a state's rights issue uh, sooner than people expect. So how, how does that work with the current administration? Yeah, well, I think I, we all owe a pretty tremendous debt to Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump because without them, these prices would be a lot higher. Right? <laughs> I, 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 happen to, I happen to think that, you know, that Sessions is, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, the, the word on the street is he's going to be out by, you know, on, on the other side of the midterms. Good riddance as far as I'm concerned. But uh, I don't think, you know, this is this is. This is the last bipartisan issue. It's 93% support uh, in the constituency heading into a midterm election. You know, so we think that this is going to really, you know, this is going to take care of itself in the not too distant future. Uh, but, but to your point, you know, we wouldn't have been able to, uh, you know, accumulate the type of exposure we have uh, if this was a different administration that had a more favorable outlook on cannabis. So, Todd, in an, uh, a Real Vision interview, you said that you saw hemp as a renaissance and farming 2.0 for American farmers. Can you just explain what you mean there and maybe for our listeners make the distinction? 
distinction between marijuana and hemp? Sure. Uh, well, you know, hemp is probably the most agile crop in the world. I mean, you could really make, uh, and again, you know, you have to view these cannabis and hemp as an ingredient, uh, not, uh, you know, not as an end product in and of itself. You know, one of the things uh, that uh, we get a lot of pushback on is people always say, well, the prices are going to go down as more people come online, more countries come online. And we just think that's great. You know, that's akin to saying Anheuser-Busch, uh, you know, would, would complain about the price of wheat going down. That's not the case you know cannabis and hemp are ingredients and hemp in particular you know which is uh, you know right now the source for for cbd but also you know again very agile i mean everything from clothing to food to building materials to plastic composites to i mean you name it i mean this is this is going to be just uh, this is going to revolutionize i think the way we we framed it as farming 2.0 or renaissance we think this is really going to you know drive a lot of uh, a lot of you know revenue a lot of jobs and and certainly uh, you know be a, a tremendous uh, industry in and of itself so we think that that's you know we think that that's an inevitable you know evolution on the farming side but you know we're not looking to to play cannabis through the lens of a farmer looking to play cannabis through the lens of you know that they, that it's an ingredient right that the margins are going to be on the back end especially as prices start coming in so you know the way to look at it is to say okay well you know if you know if you wanted to and we think cosmetics and vanity is going to be pretty big but if you wanted to uh you know buy cannabis hemp bombs thc infused hemp uh bath bombs rather uh you know you're going to be able to charge a pretty penny for that. Um, and you start talking about the cosmetics and the vanity in those applications, um, and we start to hear more about the potential for, uh, for some of these creams to remove wrinkles. I know it sounds a little pie in the sky, but trust me when I tell you that this is coming. Uh, we think that the tail on those consumer plays is just going to be pretty significant. So, you know, you're seeing it right now. You know, we talked about this a couple of years ago, how the buy build was going to move from uh, from from spirits to tobacco to uh, healthcare to consumer packaged goods. And, you know, we're pretty much there. I mean, you see Coca-Cola kicking tires. You see Philip Morris kicking tires. You see Constellation with the $5 billion infusion into Canopy. Uh, we just, you know, we still think that healthcare has got to, you know, big farm has got to turn buyer. And once they turn buyer, uh, you know, we think it's going to be a pretty powerful uh, catalyst for the space. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And I, I guess it, it is something that all these pot stocks will have to watch for because, you know, big pharma has so much money. It has so much lobbying power. Ha, have you really seen them in, enter the space in any meaningful way or lobby against this in any meaningful way? Or is it sort of too small and too early for them to get involved? Oh, they've lobbied against this for sure. I mean, they've, uh, you know, I think we've seen estimates where, you know, the, 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 there's estimates that this will take four to five billion off the top line, like right out of the gate. But, you know, I think that's just the beginning. You know, when you talk about some of these minor cannabinoids and obviously CBD gets a lot of play and, and THC gets a lot of play, although that's been demonized. Uh, but there is hundreds of cannabinoids uh, as far as people uh, can tell. I mean, nobody knows for sure because, again, the research is so difficult to come by. But, uh, you know, you're talking about things like CBN, which help with sleep and doesn't have the side effect profile of an Ambien. Uh, you know, we just think that this is going to be tremendously just disruptive uh, and, and ultimately just a tremendous uh, you know, benefit for society to be able to address your medical concerns uh, with a more de minimis risk uh, side effect profile, I think is, is just, uh, that's good news for everybody except for potentially big pharma. So just to pick up on something you said there, you said the research is really hard to come by. And I imagine part of that is because it's still a schedule one drug in a lot of countries. Uh, is there is there anywhere where re there is a lot of research happening and where maybe where our listeners can go to see the sort of cutting edge uh, of research in this area? Well, Israel's been working on this for a long time. And, you know, Spain and, and, and Italy, there's a handful. Again, the, you know, you could probably fit uh, all the people who really understand the science on the head of a pin, uh, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, but, you know, we uh, you know, our, we have a website, cb1cap.com, that we actually built a repository because we had gotten so many questions about the indications uh, and, and, and the potential indications. And, you know, again, there's been a lot of work done on the, on the endocannabinoid system, which is what we, uh, you know, on our website, cb1cap, we, we've uh, 
you know, taken a deep dive into. But, you know, as, as we look out, you know, that's, there's really not a lot of work that's been done on the phytocannabinoids uh, because of the research. So the parallels between the endocannabinoid system and the phytocannabinoid profiles still leaves a lot of work to be done, which is why I think the Western, Western medicine is so suspect of this. They still think that this is snake oil. I mean, we've had these conversations with these big pharma analysts and these biotech analysts, and they think we're crazy. Uh, we tell them what we're, you know, what we're doing, what our thesis is, and they look at us like we have four heads. People don't know what they don't know. You know, if you're not studying this in medical school and you're a doctor, you know, how, you know, I don't blame them. I would, I would have the same reaction, you know, and that I would know this. I spent, you know, a hundred years in medical school. I would know this if there was something there. Uh, but because it was a Schedule One, uh, and because the endocannabinoid system is a relatively new system uh, through the lens of health and wellness, you know, there again, people don't know what they don't know. So, Todd, you know, based on what we've seen over the last six months on the market with you know, Tilray and Canopy Growth and those sorts of those sorts of companies, we've got to ask: Do you think we're in a, a pop bubble at the moment, or is it uh, just getting started? No, I, I don't think we're in a bubble. I think certain stocks are probably ahead of their skis, uh, and that's just a function of the investment you know, the investment community not really knowing sort of the the particulars or how to value this. Wall Street doesn't cover these stocks, right? You have a couple of guys in, in, in Canada that are pretty good, uh, but everybody's pretty much learning as they go. Uh, and they're basing, in my opinion, a lot of these valuations on the on the discretionary vice valuation, which I get, right? Because that's going to be a huge market. But I don't think efficacy is priced in. Uh, I'm pretty confident based on the price action of, of a lot of our holdings that people haven't figured this out yet. Uh, but certainly that's going to change. Uh, it, it's it's changing uh, very quickly now. Uh, but people are going to you know, better understand uh, that this is actually a good thing, uh, that 9 out of 10 cannabinoids are not going to get you high, uh, but they are good for you. They're anti-inflammatory. Uh, and this is something that's going to be, you know, uh, leading to people living much healthier lifestyles. So, you know, that chasm between perception and reality is really where I think profits are. Uh, and right now, the chasm between perception and reality is still rather wide when you, you know, see these um, analysts talking about cannabis and using Cheech and Chong images to kind of convey their point, uh, we chuckle because, you know, for as long as people continue to think that this is a gateway drug, uh, there's going to be a pretty significant arbitrage in the marketplace. So, Todd, you, you've just given um, given us all a lot of information. And for a lot of our listeners out there, they, they may not have really been exposed to cannabis stocks before. So it might be a lot of new information for them. So for the beginner who's now interested in, uh, in this area, uh, where where do you think is a good place to start looking and to sort of dip their toe in, in this pretty immense pool? Yeah, no, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't uh, get to know the space by investing. I would get to know the space by researching. And certainly, you know, uh, we try to educate as we go. We offer a morning recap and a weekend recap of all the news in the space. You can sign up for that at our website as well. Uh, we're not charging for any of this. We think it's a pretty um, important uh, protocol for people to better understand. And, um, you know, so we're out there telling the story. There's a handful of other people, I think, uh, online, whether that's on Twitter or elsewhere, uh, that do a good job of trying to frame this for what it is. Uh, but we're still in the very early innings of understanding this. Um, and obviously, you know, a lot has to happen still. This has to go through the clinical pathway, at least in the U.S., um, because A, that's the only way the U.S. government can tax it, but B, you know, this is going to be medicine prescribed by doctors covered by insurance, you know, as much as it's going to be drugs from state dispensaries, right? There's going to be two markets. So it's better, it's just really understanding what this is uh, and knowing how to frame it uh, and understanding that we're still very early. So, you know, it pays to do the work as opposed to just jump in and try to pick the stock that looks good at the moment. Yeah, some great advice there, Todd. So m moving away from uh, cannabis and just very briefly, we always like to get our uh, experts opinion on on the current state of the market more more broadly and more generally. And particularly with all your expertise from your time on Wall Street, we'd be interested to know briefly what you, you see happening in the markets at the moment as a, as a whole. And, you know, do you have any major concerns or, or where do you see things going over the next sort of 12 months or so? Yeah, I, you know, it's a tough question. I think, you know, you talk about me being an expert in cannabis, I'll correct you and say, there's no such thing as an expert, right? There's a lot of explorers, there's a lot of pioneers, some, who, some of whom know more than others, 
Uh, certainly, we like to think we're pretty well informed, but this is a frontier, uh, and we're still finding our way. So, insofar that there are um, any self-proclaimed experts out there, I would be very wary of what they're trying to sell you. But in terms of uh, you know the market, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell you this or that or the other thing. You know, you're you know, it's a function of time horizon, right? Uh, it's a function of of a lot of multi. Uh, a lot of variables that you know haven't played themselves out yet. Um, I do think that the, you know that this market for for an extended period of time uh, was given drugs that masked the symptoms rather than medicine that cured the disease in the form of central bank uh, assistance and low rates. Um, and if you believe markets are free, then you know you believe that it's never wise to mess with Mother Nature. Uh, and I think we're seeing a bit of that now. But you know, as I said about you know about uh, or as you said earlier with that quote about standing in a circle shooting at the same stocks, um, you know, I'm less concerned about the market. We use it as a hedge more than anything. Uh, but I think the, the best risk reward that I've ever seen uh, in my 30 years on Wall Street is is right here in the cannabis space. So, Todd. Uh- to wrap up our interview, we always uh, ask every guest the same final three questions. So uh, we'll get on to that. And the first one is, uh, what book or books do you, uh, do you consider must-reads? Uh, wow. Uh, well, two, I would say. One of them is Man's Search for Meaning, uh, which is Viktor Frankl. Uh, and the other, I would say, is The Energy Bus by my friend John Gordon. Uh, both of which are very good, totally different reads, uh, but that's okay. So we'll add, add them up. So number two, um, where do you go to get your market information? It's another good question. Um, well, we do most of our research, oh, I should say, we do all of our research in-house because there is no Wall Street research, very very limited Wall Street research. You have the, the Canaccords of the world and the GMPs of the world and a few others up in Canada. I know, uh, you know some of them have a presence in Australia, uh, but this is a brand new space. You know, in terms of the market, you know, I, you know, I've been doing this 30 years. You know, you, you, you find your two or three or four people who you sort of have built a, a trust and respect for, and you, and at least I do. I, I try to, you know, factor their thoughts into uh, into my uh, my thought process. But at the end of the day, we each make our own decisions because we each have to live with the uh, with the results of those decisions. You know, there's a lot of noise out there. You know, I can tell you from having been in financial media that there is a uh, uh, there is a coordinated agenda to get you to click or to uh, open or to read or to watch or to uh, interact. Uh, and if there's not, then they're probably, you know, in the case of some of these social media companies, uh, listening on your smart device to what you're uh, saying and doing. I mean, if, if you don't know what the uh, what the product is, you probably are the product. But in terms of the market, you know, I, you know, I have the handful of people who I who I listen to and I listen uh, and I and I pay attention to on Twitter. But other than that, we do our in, in-house research. Yeah, nice one. So, final question, Todd, uh, and this is what we end all our interviews with. Um, if you could go back to your early days of investing, um, what's one thing that you would advise your younger self? Other than to take care of my teeth. <laughs> that's uh, a good cool one. <laughs> that's I would that's... say that uh, I would say that I would say that it would be to find yourself a sherpa or a rabbi or somebody who you trust who's going to protect you uh, and 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 build that trust and and stay close to people uh, who are going to, you know, who, who you think, you know, you can trust because uh, this is a pretty cutthroat business. Uh, everybody's out for themselves. Uh, and if you could find a few people who watch your back uh, while you watch their back, I think you're going to, uh, the sum of the parts is going to be greater than the whole. Interesting. Well, that's going to be my plan today. Go out and find a Sherpa. <laughs> so, <laughs> you might have so to go to New Zealand for that. Across the ditch. <laughs> Todd, uh, that brings us to the conclusion of our interview. Just want to say a, a massive thank you for coming on the show today. It was great to finally connect. Um, you've given us a fascinating insight into uh, the world of, of cannabis and a particularly an area that uh, is not so discussed in, in the media. And, and for the beginner investors out there, it's it's given us uh, some something to go and research further. And, you know, with Australia being the service station to the Southern Hemisphere, I think uh, it's going to be a a sector that we'll sort of closely watch over the next few years. So really appreciate you coming on and and, uh, sharing your knowledge with us. So appreciate your time. I appreciate you, gentlemen. You have a good day. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Hello, mates of Equity Mates. Or I guess that just makes you Equity Mates. Anyway, it's Bryce here. One of the most frequently asked questions we get is, where do we find information about all these stocks and, and where's a good place to start? 
Now, we could do a whole episode on this, and we often do touch on it, but the best place to start is by signing up to our Thought Starters weekly email. Each week, we send you some cool stuff that has caught our eye during the week, as well as some more detailed articles on stocks and invested relating content. We also include Basics 101. These are articles tailored specifically for beginners to really propel you on your way. We don't spam you. I mean, we hate spam. It's once a week, and there's enough stuff in there to occupy you for a full day of browsing at work. Now, Ren puts a lot of effort into finding quality articles for you guys. So if anything, just sign up so he feels the love. Head to equitymates.com and chuck in your email at the bottom of the page. Equitymates and the people appearing in this program may have positions in the companies mentioned. This is general advice only. Please speak to a financial professional to understand how it may pertain to your individual situation.